introducing our speaker for this evening session, Ms. Christine Stent Pina, who is a medical sciences, um, she's a medical sciences degree, two decades of practicing as a, as a registered dietitian and in corporate wellness, along with earning her degree in life as a working wife and mom. She has developed academic and personal skills. She relates to the very real challenges that many people face when it comes to implementing personal wellness in today's fast-paced, ever-changing environment. To thrive rather than survive, we must develop the capacity for resilience. In the world of wellness, her special interest lies in the gut-brain connection. But outside of nutrition, her passion and strength is in, monet is in mentoring and motivating individuals. Her empathy and intuition have guided her in all work decisions and problem solving. She works well in teams and enjoys the power of minds working together to achieve a, co a common goal. She has a bigger picture thinking ability and would like to create solutions that are out of the box. She enjoys hiking and cycling along with family board games. Our speaker this evening is quite interesting and I'd like to hand over to you, Ms. Christine. And thank you once again for agreeing to speak for us this evening. Over to you. Thank you, Boitamelo, for such a warm welcome. It is lovely to be with you all this evening. Thank you for giving up your time. I hope you are comfortable and you have a beverage in your hand because we are talking about an incredible topic. So let me just share my presentation with you at this point and then we can get started. Right. Can everybody see my presentation? Right, let's get going. So what are we going to talk about this evening? Very quickly, we're going to look at the impact that chronic stress has on our body systems. And then we're going to talk about two brains. Are you ready for this? Now, a lot of us know about the brain up here, but I'm going to introduce you to a second brain that has actually changed science. It's changed the dietitian world, how we treat health, medical conditions, our mood disorders, mental disorders. So it's quite exciting, this brain that I'm going to introduce you to. And we're going to talk about a gut-brain connection and, of course, look at some nutritional tips. And I promise you right up front, I'm not here to give you a diet or give you a lecture on what is a carbohydrate, a protein, and a fat. We're going to have a lot more fun than that. All right, so let's have a look. Chronic stress. I think it's not a matter of are we stressed. We are. It's more about how stressed are we? And I'm sure you'll agree with me that over the last four or five years, our stress levels have reached max. You know, whether it's personal stress, work stress, financial stress, we're worried about the future. Perhaps it's stress around your health or the health of a loved one. But either way, we are battling with the stress. And the problem is, you know, having Stress for a short while, that's absolutely fine. But when we've got this chronic lingering stress, what happens is it's a survival mechanism of our body. We kick into a chemical reaction within this body of ours and we produce a cascade of hormones. So we produce cortisol, adrenaline, insulin, amongst others. And what happens when these linger in our body, they negatively affect all of our body systems. And I won't go into this in a lot of detail, but if we've got chronic stress left, you know, we don't do anything about it, it impacts our cardiovascular health. Our blood pressure increases, um, our cholesterol increases. We also start to see our skin system is impacted. You might have a dry skin or an oily skin, or you're getting breakouts or eczema, or your hair's gone dry or it falls out. Um, you might find your nails are brittle on your toes and your fingers, or you get a wound and you just, your skin doesn't heal. Stress impacts our joints, our muscles. I get a lot of people saying to me, oh, Christine, I think I've got arthritis. My muscles ache, my joints are sore. And they don't have arthritis. It's just this inflammation that chronic stress is causing within our bodies. I mean, even our immunity is impacted. I don't know if you can relate to that. You know, maybe a fever blister or a sty, or you get a cold or flu, and you just take so long to get better. You don't heal well. 
it's like our defenses aren't working. Our fighter cells are not working well. And even the reproductive system, um, fertility issues, hormone imbalances, um, increased PMS in women, um, and lack of libido, which then it's a, that affects relationships, that affects our mood. But I think the two systems that affect us the most with stress are our brain and our gut. And I'm sure you can relate to this when you've just had lingering stress and you just, do you ever get like brain fog where your brain just feels so thick, you battle to concentrate, you're a lot more irritable and short, you're a lot more moody than you used to be. Or perhaps you do now have anxiety that you've never had before, or the anxiety that was kind of okay is now like on another level. Or maybe you really are depressed and in a bad place. So that is how stress affects the brain. And then the gut, interestingly, we are seeing that stress causes something called irritable bowel syndrome, spastic colon, where, you know, you're not sick enough to be in hospital, but you've got this irritation, bloating, constipation, diarrhea, heartburn, just this abdominal discomfort. And what happens with stress is that even when we're eating, possibly healthy food, we might not be absorbing it because all these stress hormones are flying through our body and negatively affecting our gut walls, our gut lining, and then we start getting nutrient deficiencies. And today, I'm sure you're making the link here, we are going to be talking about the brain and the gut in particular that is so affected by stress and what can we do to improve it. Because I think a lot of our solutions come with, let's take a medication for our brain, which is fine. There's a place for that. But there's got to be another way to solving mood disorders, irritability, fatigue, health conditions, more than just medicine or just therapy. There's got to be more. And that's what I'm going to show you. So the one thing I think you'll agree with me, and I wish there was another way, it's not easy to change the stress in our lives. We can't just immediately remove the stress. I mean, that would solve everything, right? But what we can do is we can have some sense of control in the situation. We can boost our body's resilience. We can build our body's fighter cells. We can build our gut. We can build our systems so that we are not affected by stress. We can almost avoid the side effects and the symptoms that are associated with long-term stress. So in a world where we feel out of control with the stress, I'm going to show you how we can gain a sense of control. Does that make sense? And how do we do this? Well, obviously, as a dietitian, I get super excited here because we can do this through the science of nutrition. So what I'm saying here is we're not looking at fad diets, liquid diets, you know, becoming a vegan, cutting out carbs, keto, you know, these crazy diets out there. No, that's not what today is about. We are going to look at how science of what we eat can improve our health generally. But most importantly, I know what you're all interested in, is how can nutrition help us to be in a better mood, help us to cope with stress better? How can nutrition possibly reduce depression and anxiety? And I'm going to say that boldly. And I think it's about seeing food differently. So often when I speak to people, you know, we associate nutrition with weight loss. Do you agree with me? You know, we're going to eat to lose weight or we're going to eat to manage our diabetes or we're going to eat to reduce our cholesterol and that's about it. But there's so much more to food. We can eat in a way that can actually affect our genetics. We can eat in a way, which I'm going to show you, is going to boost our gut health and boost our brain chemicals, which indirectly put it all together, can improve our mood. So we need to start seeing food as our medicine. Now, the one thing we know is that what we eat directly impacts how we feel later on. So in my practice as a dietitian, we often go through what does a person eat in a day and how do they feel? And we start seeing little links. So we see that, for example, what you eat in the morning does its magic in the late afternoon. 
Now, I don't know how many of you get an energy dip or a mood or an irritation or a craving around about three o'clock, four, five o'clock in the afternoon. This is a common time that we see this. Now, what we have discovered is that it's not just you've got a long day or your boss has irritated you, you know, no. It's often linked to what you've eaten or not eaten earlier in the day. Did you have enough protein? Did you snack? What did you snack on? Were your sugar levels stable? Was it, did you drink enough? All those things impact your energy, your mood, and your cravings in the late afternoon. Something as simple as just drinking enough, which we'll get to later, that can impact headaches. Our brain is 60% fluid. If we are not hydrating that brain, often we have a headache. So if we just drink more, we can get rid of the headache. You know, and it's, we've got to start almost finding out what are our personal links? What are we doing that could possibly affecting how we feel? You know, for some people, they might have a food intolerance. You know, they eat milk, ice cream, and cheese, and they get diarrhea. So we need to change that. So I think where I'm going with this is if we change what we eat or how we eat or what we put together, and it's not going on a diet, it's often, which I'll show you a little bit later, it's often just about introducing a few superfoods, a few foods that you've probably got at home that we're just not doing enough of. We can change how we feel. And for me, this is a great motivation on why should you change what you eat? Because so many, of we've got so much on our plate. Why must we now look at what we eat? It's like another thing to do. Well, I'm hoping this presentation is going to convince you that it's going to be worth it. All right. So I'm going to come back to the nutrition side. Let's just park that for a second. I want to just talk about the brain that we know very, very briefly. So the brain in our head. Okay. We know that the brain governs everything that we do, that we feel, that we think. And this is all our physical and emotional, voluntary and involuntary actions. So it's blinking our eyes, it's talking, it's swallowing, breathing, the heart beating, moving our limbs, um, our thought patterns, how do we sleep? The brain controls all of this. And the brain is interesting because it's different every day. You know, some days we're very happy and energized and we feel very good and things just work well. Other days it's a disaster. We feel stressed, anxious, sad, tired, and, and, and quite frankly, unwell. And how does the brain actually do this for us? Well, it produces chemicals. We call them neurotransmitters. And obviously there's a lot more to this. I'm just trying to simplify it a little bit. But the three chemicals that are quite important to us are GABA. Now, GABA is a chemical that the brain makes, and it helps us to feel calm. It's our relaxing agent. So we need this because we need to feel calm in today's world. And then we get dopamine, which is fantastic if we've got enough of it. We don't want too much, but we don't want too little. And dopamine helps us to be motivated, focus, concentrate. And what we know is if we have too much dopamine, and sometimes that's from eating the wrong things, living the wrong lifestyle, we can actually have addictive personalities. We can feel more stressed. We can feel more anxious. But if we've got just enough, we can feel quite like, motivated to do things. We think clearly. And of course, the favorite one, which I'm going to talk about a bit later as well, is serotonin. So I'm not sure if you've heard of serotonin, but it's a wonderful chemical that our brain makes. It's our natural antidepressant. So it helps us to feel calm and in control. But it's got quite a few other functions as well. It helps us to sleep. It helps with our temperature regulation, our digestion, how we maintain our weight as well. And it really just helps us to feel good. So we need this. And thankfully, if things are going well, um, our brain produces these. Now, this is where it gets interesting. We have a little bit of a twist. I'm going to introduce you to the second brain. Now, the second brain is actually our gut. It's our digestive system. And our digestive system, or this gut, the second brain, is actually made up of what we know is a microbiome. You might hear this word now that I've mentioned it, or you can go and do a bit of research on microbiome. But basically, our, our large intestine, our digestive system, is made up of trillions of bacteria. Uh, the fancy word is microbes. 
Now, our health depends on the state of this microbiome. So this microbiome that lives within us, in fact, we are mostly bacteria. Do you know that? We are something like 90% bacteria in our body. And if this microbiome is in good health and this ecosystem works well together in our body, things work well. But if there are imbalances, it's not so good, which we'll get to. Now, we've got about up to 1,500 different species of bacteria in our digestive system. Can you believe it? So you and me have over a 1,000 different bacteria. Now, what's important to know is that each species of bacteria has a specific function. There are a multitude of functions. I mean, I've just summed up a few. But some bacteria help us to digest our food to break it down, um, and they help our body to almost utilize the nutrients for our body functions. Then there's other bacteria that work with our hormones, and we know what a critical role hormones have, right, in, in every aspect of our life. They also protect us from the bad germs, uh, toxins, poisons, pollution, um, processed foods, uh, medications. And then other bacteria actually help us to use our medicines. So we take medicine, but I don't know if you've ever had it where you take medicine and it doesn't work. If we don't have healthy bacteria in our gut, we can take medicine and it's not as effective as it should be. And also we've got bacteria that balances our blood sugar levels and also that makes brain chemicals, which is what we're talking about today. Now, what's absolutely critical about this gut of ours is that we have a diversity of bacteria. We can't just have one or two. It's like the more bacteria we have, the better, because this is directly linked to our physical and our mental health. So we actually know that some bacteria plays a role in the prevention of diabetes, the prevention of cholesterol. We are starting to see also how some bacteria possibly not good bacteria, play a role in Alzheimer's, dementia, depression, anxiety, mood disorders. Now, unfortunately, stress, life, a poor diet, certain medicines, these impact our diversity. And what happens is we start off when we're young with all thousands of beautiful bacteria all doing their functions. The ecosystem is working really well and we are healthy. But as we get older, for various reasons, we start losing certain bacteria and we have less diversity. So instead of having a thousand, we've got like 500. And the problem is if we don't have the diversity and, and all the different bacteria in our system, we start getting health issues, heartburn, indigestion, headaches, fatigue, diabetes, chronic diseases, immune issues, and mood disorders. I'm just trying to make the link here with our mood as well. Now, just a, a quick fact, this second brain, our gut, actually weighs the same as our brain, weighs about three kilos. So there's a lot of similarities here. And also interesting fact, 80% of our immune system is actually within our gut. That's quite important, eh? So if our gut is not healthy, we are not going to have a strong immune system. If we don't have a strong immune system, we get sick more easily. And our immunity is also linked to our brain health, anxiety, mood, depression as well. What we also know about this incredible microbiome of ours, if things are functioning well, it produces hormones, ghrelin and leptin. These are two very important hormones because they help us to be hungry when we should be, and they help us to be full after you know, we've eaten. Now, the problem is if we don't have all the bacteria and our gut is not in a good place, we don't make these, or we make maybe too much ghrelin, and then we're hungry all the time. So we are seeing even obesity, uh, people who are really struggling with their weight. They're making too much ghrelin. They're not making enough leptin because the bacteria in the gut is not functioning well. But what's most interesting of tonight is that 95% of serotonin, remember the chemical I spoke about just now? Serotonin we make in our brain, and it helps us to sleep helps us to feel calm, in control. It's our natural antidepressant. 95% is made in our digestive system. Only 5% is made in our brain. Quite interesting, hey? 
Okay, so if we don't have a healthy gut and we don't make enough serotonin, it's going to impact our mood, our sleep, our weight, our digestion. So really, at the end of the day, it all comes down to a balance between the good bacteria and the bad bacteria in our gut. It's almost like a war that's happening. And unfortunately, with life, with age, with processed food, medicine, stress, we're going to get the bad bacteria climbing into our digestive system. But if we keep the good stuff there, we can fight those guys and get rid of them, if that makes sense. So can you believe this is all happening in your gut right now while we're sitting here? So I think if I had to sum it up, the outside factors do disrupt our microbiome. And what happens is when the bacteria are disrupted, we get what we call a dysbiosis or an imbalance, and then it's not happy. And then what happens is our gut wall gets affected. It gets little holes in. Toxins can seep through into the bloodstream. We get inflammation. We don't make happy chemicals. And then we get health issues and we get mood changes. Now, I thought I would just share a little bit of research with you because there might be some of you out there, the scientists who are saying, hold on, where the studies done on this? There are many studies, um, animal studies and also human studies, looking at the impact of the bacteria in our gut and our mood. So I'm just going to discuss two very quickly with you. Um, I love this one. This was way back in 2004, but they had two sets of mice, okay? The one group of mice had a very healthy digestive system. It had all the bacteria, um, it had a gut, it had a microbiome. And then it had another group of mice where they removed the bacteria. They made the mice sterile. So they cleaned out all the germs. There was nothing good. There was nothing bad. There was no bacteria. And then they exposed both groups of mice to very stressful situations. Now, interestingly, both responded to the stress negatively. Um, they, they battled. It wasn't fun. They got anxious. But the group of mice that had no bacteria in their gut responded the most severely. So what the study did, I, I did, I'm really summarizing this, is it shows us that bacteria affect our brain and influence our level of anxiety and how we cope with stress. It's so interesting, isn't it? You know, we're always told with stress, it's, yes, it's counseling and it's stress management or it's medication or a supplement or a vitamin or have a rest, take a holiday. Yes, all of that's important. But we're not talking about what's your gut like? Have you got the right bacteria in your digestive system? Because we could possibly sort out some of the problem. And then another interesting study, um, this was done in 2016, it was a fecal transplant, yes, I know. So usually happy mice run around, they like to socialize, they, they're interested in exploring. So what they did, they took a group of happy mice, and then they took the stool from depressed humans. So humans that were really battling with deep depression, deep anxiety, really in a bad space, and they took some of their feces, I know, it sounds terrible, and they did a transplant into the mice's gut, and then they observed what happened. How interesting is this? The mice now have new bacteria that's been introduced into their digestive system, and they became depressed. They stopped socializing, they weren't interested in anything, all from somebody else's bacteria. And they've actually done this in humans as well. So what we are seeing through the various studies is that bacteria can actually control our brain. Sounds quite freaky, doesn't it? And it can change our thoughts and our behaviors as well. So I think what we're getting to here is the right bacteria is a possible solution. It's not the solution. It is part of the solution to mental health issues and mental health struggles, which for me is so exciting. I've had patients in my practice who've battled with depression, battled with anxiety, but they've never really looked at their nutrition. They've never really looked at their gut. Then we start looking at their gut, feeding the gut the right stuff. And it's been incredible what we've seen, the changes in mood, the upliftment. Some of them have reduced their medications to lower doses. Um, so it's been interesting. 
So let's just dabble a little bit more into the gut-brain connection before we get to food. Like, how is it linked? That's what everybody says, you know, asks me, is how are these two brains connected? We've got the brain, we've got the gut. We are now learning that the gut does influence our thoughts and our mood and our health. How? How is it linked? Well, it's really clever. We've got something called the gut-brain axis. And this is a, a real thing. We have a nerve. It's called the vagus nerve. And it starts at the, the brain stem and it goes all the way down to the digestive system. So it's one of the longest nerves in our body. And how I like to think about this connection, it's like a very busy highway. It's a bi-directional, so it's a two-way two flow of information between the gut and the brain. And it's busy. And what happens is that all the activity that's happening in the brain, the, the emotional, the cognitive activity, is linked to all the activity that is happening in the digestive system. So if you can imagine that the two systems talk to each other, they talk about your happiness, they talk about how much brain power is going to be needed to do a certain body function, they talk, they communicate. And in fact, on this highway, they also communicate with other systems like our immune system, and they send messages to what we call the endocrine system, which is how we handle stress. So it's quite exciting, this chatting. Now, of course, this is all great if there's no traffic. How many of you have been on a highway? I've been driving from Benoni to Johannesburg every day last week, and traffic is not fun. It causes problems in a, a very nice highway. Lifestyle issues. So Obviously, stress, medicine, poor diet, processed foods, toxins, smoking, pollution, illness, life, lack of activity, all of this gets in the way of this highway and it starts causing blockages or, or roadblocks. And now the messages can't go. So the digestive system wants to send a message to the brain, but it can't get there or it gets there very, very slowly. Or the brain wants to send a message to the guts to do something, but it can't get there. And that's the problem. And if we don't have a good, smooth highway, there's a way of doing this through nutrition, through lifestyle. What happens is it can influence our mood, our cognitive function, even how we react to stress. Can you believe it? So the state of this highway and how many bacteria you have, how in communication the brain and the gut are, will actually determine how you cope with stress. It even has a link with your memory, how you age, and, and, and so much more. So I hope it's got you a little bit excited about how the brain and the digestive system are so connected. And maybe this is another route. If you are a health caregiver or a health professional, this is maybe something you could bring into your, your treatments. Um, or if you're not in the health world, this is just for yourself. It's something that you could start investigating for you. Now, just quickly, I want to point out, because a lot of people will say to me, but I don't have digestive you know, symptoms, and I'm still battling with you know, irritability and mood issues, but my gut's fine. We always think that a poor gut looks like this. Am I right? So like, if you've got gut issues, we typically think bloating, diarrhea, constipation, and gas. That's gut issues, right? It is. But we've got other gut issues as well, symptoms that could be. You're not healing from infections. You're getting sick all the time. Skin irritations, breakouts, eczema, joint pain, aches. You, you're gaining weight. You're losing weight. Uh, you've got deficiencies, lack of energy, cravings, brain fog, anxiety, depression. Those are also symptoms of a poor gut. So these are things when you visit your doctor, we need to talk about it because often we just say, so you're not constipated? Great. No diarrhea? No bloating? Okay, well, you're fine. Your gut is fine. Not necessarily. You've got any of those other symptoms like you're tired, you're struggling with low energy, you're irritable, you're moody. Have you looked at your gut? Okay, so it's not always what you're feeling in your, your colon or your tummy. Now, 
Interestingly, I just wanted to give you a fact. 60 to 80% of patients with depression and anxiety have got gastro problems. We often see that link. I see it in my practice all the time. So somebody will come with, you know, to me to lose weight and I'll start talking about their gut. They haven't even mentioned depression, anxiety, none of that. But they will we'll start looking at their gut and I start, you know, digging. And I go, you know, do you battle with irritability, mood swings, hormone changes? They're like, yeah, actually, now that you mention it. So this tells us a wonderful story as well. Okay, now I thought it, it's a bit of humor, but we need to know our poo, okay? How many of you, when you go to the toilet for a number two, actually look at your poo? Okay, you need to. This is like, I'm giving you an instruction. You need to do this. Your poo tells us, your stool tells us a story. Okay, now the ideal for a healthy gut is it somewhere between type three and type four? This is called the Bristol stool chart. So the, the state of your stool can actually tell us a lot about what are you eating or not eating, what is missing in your diet. So ideally you want it to be nice and smooth, kind of like a sausage or somebody says like soft serve ice cream. Nice, no lumps, no little balls, not runny like liquid, kind of together and it flushes easily. Somewhere between type three and four, that is what you're looking for. If you've got little balls or what we call in South Africa, bok drolakis, that can mean you're not drinking enough, you're dehydrated, you don't have enough fiber. But if it's very, very runny, you've also got the wrong fiber. There's an infection happening there. So it might be worth investigating, looking at your stool, looking at the color. Does it break? Does it smell? Does it float? It tells us a story. Okay, but ideally you're looking for something nice and soft and smooth and it flushes and it's easy. We should be able to sit on the loo, go to the toilet, finish, done, and we feel finished. If you ever go to the toilet and you don't feel finished, like there's more, but it can't come out, that can also be a gut issue as well. All right, so I know I need to move it with time, um, but that's a little introduction to the gut-brain connection. So now that we know this, and we know that we've got this beautiful ecosystem within our body at our disposal, how do we look after it? That's the key. How do we boost these bacteria? I think what's most important is that you appreciate that it's a relationship. Now, between the bacteria and us, we call it a mutualistic relationship. It's a bit of a friendship. Um, and, and you don't want to get on each other's bad side. Okay, so we need each other. The, we need the bacteria, right? We need the bacteria because it makes serotonin, which keeps us happy. It keeps us controlling our blood sugar levels. It helps us with our hormones. It helps us with diabetes, cholesterol, weight management, sleep. So we need this bacteria because it really helps us. But the bacteria need us big time. We've got to feed them because this bacteria are greedy. They are, they are very hungry and they need specific food in order to thrive. And we are the only ones that can give it that food to thrive. So let's have a look at what we've got to do. I call them the gut brain boosters. So first of all, we've got to start looking at gut-friendly liquids. What are we giving our body? We need liquid, but what liquid? Okay, I think you know this, but we've got to cut down on the sugary beverages, the, the fizzy drinks, the juices, the energy drinks, um, you know, Energy, Powerade, Red Bull, Dragons, um, the, all that sugar. What it does is it disrupts the bacteria and it kills the good stuff off. And the bad bacteria feed off the sugar. Now, I'm not anti-sugar. Please, everybody, there's a place for, the, for, for sugar and treats. I'm talking about if it's every day. You know, we're even looking at like the sugar in your tea and your coffee and your cappuccinos, your milkshakes. We've got to watch how much we're having because that really disrupts our digestive system. And I know you know it, but we've got to drink a lot more liquid. It, our, our, we needed to soften the stool. We needed to break down the food we eat to transport the nutrients. And of course, we ideally need good, clear, good old water. But I know that water doesn't always taste amazing for all of us. So we can kind of flavor it up. Put some lemons and cucumber or oranges and mint leaves. These are actually wonderful for your liver, your kidneys and your gut. 
Um, what I often do at my house is I'll, I'll chop up like um, a ginger, which is good for the digestive system, lemons, and mint leaves. And I put them in little ice cubes and then I just freeze them. And then in the morning, I boil up water in, in winter or if it's cold, you know, summer, I'll put cold water and I just throw the ice cubes in and all that ginger, mint and lemon actually dissolves into the water. So that's what we've got to start doing, you know, carrying the water bottle with you, hydrating through the day. Fridge is 100% is okay, um, but it needs to be diluted quite a lot as well. And don't forget herbal teas. I mean, herbal teas count as water. In winter, I often don't drink water water. I will boil up my water and I'll have like a ginger peppermint, like a herbal tea. These are just a few teas that are really good for the digestive system. Your green tea has got something called polyphenols in, which is stunning for the gut, the brain. It's a natural energizer as well. Even your ginger, your peppermint tea, really healing on the gut, but also energizers. Fennel, energizer. Kombucha, has anybody heard of this? So it's basically a tea bag, and they include a bacteria with a tea. So it's a, a SCOBY, they call it. And it's a love sweet beverage made from bacteria. It sounds awful, but it's actually wonderful for you. And, you know, alcohol, I'm going to mention because it's under beverages. Look, the problem with alcohol, as we get older, we become more sensitive to alcohol. And if your gut is not in a good place and your microbiome is disrupted and there's inflammation and there's not enough good bacteria, we don't handle alcohol well. And then we get the side effects that are associated with alcohol. Also, our digestive system produces an enzyme. It's called alcohol dehydrogenase quite fancy. Now, unfortunately, our enzyme gets less and less and less over the age of 40. But if our gut's not great, we're going to make even less of this enzyme. So what happens is too much alcohol can disrupt the bacteria, it can affect the lining of the digestive system, cause inflammation, which indirectly affects our mood as well. So What's the solution? Look, depending on the state of your digestive system and the state of your mental health, you know, if you are battling with depression, irritability, a lot of stress, sometimes we say take an alcohol sabbatical. It's not forever, but just kind of go dry for a while. It could be really good for you. Otherwise, it's all about moderation. So we do prefer that at least three or four days in your week, you don't have alcohol. This just shows you don't need it, sort of sense of survival, okay, to survive. You just enjoy it, and it's nice to have. And it really is about everything in moderation. So with your gut, you can have it. But when you have it, we usually suggest males, you know, two to three units at a time. And if you look at the screen, that's what a unit is, like sort of your old-fashioned sizes, and if it's ladies, one to two. So if you're going to have a drink tonight, one to two glasses of wine as a lady would be absolutely acceptable. And of course, we've got to watch what we mix with our alcohol. So if we're mixing Coke and sugary drinks, we're adding the whole sugar thing to the alcohol. It's almost like a double whammy for the digestive system. Okay, next point, if we look at a good brain gut booster, and I know you know this, so it's coming fruit and vegetables. And this is something I just feel we're not getting enough in. I mean, even our battle sometimes, but why do we need it? First of all, it provides us with much needed fiber. Now, our bacteria love fiber. It's like its favorite food. So if we've got fiber in the diet, what the bacteria do, it sounds gross, but it ferments the fiber. It produces something called a short-chain fatty acid, and that short-chain fatty acid nourishes our gut and helps us to absorb nutrients. Vegetables and fruit give us fiber. They also give us something called a prebiotic. Now, a probiotic is friendly bacteria in our gut that you can get from food and supplements, but the prebiotic is almost like the fertilizer or the, the food that feeds the bacteria. And we get this in fruit and vegetables. And of course, fruit and vegetables give us antioxidants, vitamin C, magnesium, folic acid, and these are critical nutrients that are needed for our brain. So to prevent depression, anxiety, to boost your mood, your health, we need antioxidants, vitamin C, magnesium, folic acid, fiber, prebiotics. So what I kind of suggest to my clients is the 2-2 rule. 
Try and get two cups of vegetables in every day and two pieces of fruit. If you can do that, that is a great starting point. And you don't have to have a different fruit every day, but try and get different colors. You know, what you get in the green, you don't get in the red. So we need it. We need the rainbow. But even if this week it's bananas and apples every day, and then next week it could be grapes and kiwi fruit. You know, you can rotate it over the months so that you get the different nutrients. But fruit makes a great snack. You know, mid-morning, mid-afternoon, there's your fruit. Or you can put fruit in a smoothie. Or chop fruit into a salad is actually nice. Like an orange in a salad is beautiful. And two fruits I really want to mention for you. Pawpaw or papaya and pineapple. They are the only two fruits that have digestive enzymes. Bromelain and papaya. And these digestive enzymes boost our gut health, which boost our brain health. So try and get those in if you can. And vegetables, please, raw, fresh, frozen, it doesn't matter. Get them in. Put a tomato-based sauce on. Grate a little bit of cheese on top if you have to. But focus on the ones you enjoy. So the 2-2 rule. Two fruits, two cups of veg. Okay, fiber we definitely need, as I mentioned, it softens the stool. It adds bulk to our stool. Fiber also keeps us full, you know, which is nice. It prevents us craving sweets and junk and processed food. But it also stabilizes our blood sugar, gives us vitamin B12, which we need for the brain. So there's a lot of benefits from fiber. Where do we get it? Okay, we get it in fruit and vegetables, but we also get it in our beans and our legumes. And these are also, you know, not expensive. If you buy them dry and you soak them and you cook them, or you can buy them in the tins, red beans, butter beans, chickpeas, lentils, add them into your rice, add them into a stir fry, mash them. I've had people mash them onto toast, but let's get those in. They are a wonderful source of fiber and nutrients for your gut. Oats, oatmeal, the traditional oats. You can have it, you know, cooked with an apple and a little bit of honey and some seeds on top. Or how I do my oats is I'll get a yogurt and I will put dry oats and a bit of cinnamon and some fruit. That's also nice. You can put oats um, into a smoothie. You can even make flour from oats. You blend it into a flour and you make a muffin. But oats is something I would really highly recommend for your gut. And when it comes to breads, crackers, cereals, starches, the aim is to simply go whole grain. So instead of white bread, go whole grain bread. Instead of white pasta, whole wheat pasta. You know, bringing in foods like sweet potatoes or your cereals, bran cereal over white cornflakes cereal. The fiber it, it, we don't get enough fiber in our diet in today's society. So, and really, it doesn't have to be a diet. You know, you just do two fruits, two cups of vegetables, you're already winning. You throw in some beans and legumes maybe twice a week. You have oats once or twice a week, a sweet potato once a week. You know, you're getting there. But try and pick the whole grains. Okay. And something that I really feel we don't do enough of is eat healthy fat. So, with our guts, saturated fat, these are the unhealthy fats, like skin on the chicken, fat on the meat, deep fried, like your takeouts, you know, your processed sausages and vors, poloni. Those are not healthy fats. They actually disrupt the bacteria in our guts in a big way. They really, really do. The fats we need are from nature because they help with our gut lining. In fact, all of our membranes in our brain and our gut require fat, but this fat, it's our sense, our source of omegas, vitamins, antioxidants. They keep us full. They get rid of cravings. And interestingly, the nutrients from avocado, olives, nuts, peanut butter actually help us to make serotonin. Remember the happy chemical? I mean, you look at that nut on the screen. It looks like a brain. That's the walnut. And the nice thing with this food group is you don't need a lot. You know, you just have half an avo twice a week or you have a tablespoon of peanut butter every second day or you have a little handful of nuts or peanuts and raisins or a little bit of mixed seeds into your yogurt your cereal your porridge your stir fry it doesn't have to be a lot very small portions a couple of days a week even really boost our health we need to start bringing those in um 
I'm, I'm, I'm very sensitive of time. I'm probably going to be about another five minutes and then we're going to get to Q&A. Protein is also really important to everybody. Um, and, I, and the more natural, the better. So we want to try and avoid the processed meat. Our sausages, Viennas, our Russians, the polonies, the cold meats, they put something called nitrites in and a lot of fat, which actually disrupt the good bacteria. They kill the bacteria. They disrupt the, the gut lining. I'm talking about quality proteins because they help us to build, to repair. They give us amino acids, magnesium, calcium, all needed for the brain. So your calcium, magnesium, vitamin B12, what we call amino acids are required for brain. Creatine, you may have heard of in the gym, but creatine is needed for brain health, mood, reducing anxiety. We get it from protein. Protein helps us to sleep. It also makes um, your dopamine that keeps us motivated. It makes serotonin. Do you know what foods make this best, the best proteins for serotonin? Chicken, yogurt, cheese, milk, fish. So if we can get those in, your oily fish as well, pilchard, sardines, tuna. And if you're on a budget or you are vegetarian, don't forget our vegetarian sources. Tofu is from a plant. Edamame beans are from a plant. Beans and lentils give you protein, and they're a little bit cheaper as well. Soya is fantastic. You can start bringing that in. So ideally, we're aiming for protein at every meal. You know, eggs, oh, eggs, eggs give us choline, which is superb for the guts, but also for the brain. So you have a piece of whole grain toast with an egg in the morning. Beautiful. You know, for lunch, you've got a, I'm just trying to think, a whole grain pasta with a tuna salad. Dinner, a sweet potato with a piece of chicken or a piece of fish. Your snacks can be yogurt and nuts. Does that make sense? And the last foods that I'm going to mention, this, this is different, but you might have heard of fermented foods. So plain yogurt is one of our well-known. And you can look on this yogurt. It actually says bifidobacterium cultures. So when you buy yogurt, look for one that says it's got cultures in it. That would be great to include. Kimchi is something different. You can make it yourself or you can buy it. It's a fermented cabbage, carrot, and radish with a bit of spice. And you can put it on a potato. You can put it on bread. You can put it um, in a stew. It's actually quite delicious. Sauerkraut is fermented cabbage. Kefir is like a fermented milk, and it's got a lot of probiotics in that you drink. Kombucha I introduced you to earlier. It's like a tea with the bacteria. It's very nice tasting. And something like soya beans, temper. The thing with fermented foods, the fermentation process produces these bacteria that feed our gut. These are fantastic if you can bring them in. And actually something very interesting for me, this is quite new for me to have discovered, it's called a psychobiotic. You might have heard of a probiotic. You usually take those when you've had antibiotics and they boost your gut health. Well, we've got what we call psychobiotic, which is saying good for the brain, the psycho, psycho, psychology. And this we find in yogurt and milk, kefir, sauerkraut. It's neuroactive gut bacteria. So it's a species of bacteria. And I've written them, bifido and lactobacillus, that specifically work on our psychology. Isn't that exciting? So even if you're looking for a supplement, you can look for one that has got those two bacteria in. So look, nutrition is so big. This topic is massive, as you can see. I, I wish I had a whole day to talk about it with you. But I, I hope it's got you excited that there is a connection and we can't ignore our gut. And don't forget, there are also other factors that boost our gut health as well. Yes, it's our fruits, our vegetables. Our, it's almost going as natural as you can, Yes, have the sweets, have the treats, the processed food every now and again, not as our normal. But I don't have time to go into this, but we mustn't forget that exercise, being active, stress management techniques, just sleep. If you are not sleeping well, that actually impacts the quality of our bacteria. Even toxins, you know, where you work, pollution, smoking, alcohol. 
Um, if you if you are struggling with your weight and you really are finding that you've got you're carrying a lot of weight, obesity impacts our bacteria. And it's not that we can't have antibiotics. There's a place for them. But but be smart about it. You know, if you are having antibiotics, be be really careful. Drink your herbal teas, have your fruit and vegetables, your chicken, your fish, your nuts, and possibly take a probiotic supplement. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry I've gone a little over time, but I just I, I want to encourage you to take this a step further. Talk to your medical professionals about it. Speak to a dietitian. Do a bit of research because at the end of the day, it is your decision. It's your gut. And I think if we start making our gut and our mental health a priority, it's important. There's a benefit to looking after our gut. It'll improve our mind, our minds, our moods, our relationships. You know what I mean? If we feel good, if we are happier, healthier, it's like a ripple effect into everything. Our work life, our personal life, and we cope with stress better because I'm not saying the stress is going to go it's probably going to stay but we'll cope better okay so thank you so much for for listening and I'm seeing all the hands and the hearts go up I, I really am grateful but I'm going to open the floor to the questions boy Tamelo. thank you so much Chris I mean as a certified <laughs> a self-certified foodie myself I was Are quite you? You're self-certified. I was quite interested to hear about, you know, um, how our food can really impact our mood. It's just a pity I didn't see McDonald's under the healthy foods list, but that's fine. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to quickly say this, Boy Tomelo. So the trick is, and I've seen this with my patients, mm -hmm. build the system, tick the boxes, get the good stuff in, eat all the right stuff so that you sort of keep this strong so that when McDonald's comes... It bounces off. So you enjoy it, but you don't ah, see it. We can so still you can enjoy I'm an ice cream chocolate fanatic. Um, so I make sure I get the good stuff in because I'm enjoying my ice cream and my chocolate. It's all about balance. Lots of stuff. It's all about balance. You heard it from the lady herself. So <laughs> don't feel guilty when you indulge in that late night chocolate. Well, I won't say late night, but in that chocolate or in that McDonald's. But we're quickly going to dive into the Q&A. There are quite a few questions under the chat box. Um, the first one, Chris, is assuming that what we really eat is soil. How can it be made possible that when it is ingested, it provides RDA? When den denudation of soil is done by huge companies like Monsanto, who overexploit the soil. I'm not sure if this is something that you can uh, add, Look, yeah. this is a, a very valid point. And this is the problem. You know, years ago, when mm -hmm. we were farmers and we made everything organically and there weren't all these toxins and fertilizers, it was just so natural. Our food really was healthy. So when we ate a carrot... We got carotene. When we ate an orange, we got vitamin C. Mm. And it is a good point. Look, I'm not fully clued up on the soils and how it works and with the pHs and what they're doing. I do know there is an impact with the soil. I mean, we even see in various um, places from Cape Town to Johannesburg, you know, which fruits grow better depending on the moisture of the soil and the nutrient value of the soil. Mm. I, so I don't have an answer for this because, you know, these are things that are out of a lot of our control. So I know a lot of people are suggesting just more from, you know, poisons and fertilizers that are put on our fruits to wash everything well but this is where we look at the, maybe the benefit of supplementation, you know, where food isn't always what it used to be. So, yes, mm -hmm. it gives us fiber and a lot of nutrients, but sometimes we've got to rely on good supplementation as well together. Um, but the dream is obviously growing our own vegetables, knowing the type of soil where it comes from. But it's a valid point. I don't have a solution on it, though. I, I'm mm -hmm. not fully clued up on it. No, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, and then Sharon would like to know if you think regular fasting is healthy, for example, 30 hours long, I'm um, just having water. And I'll add a twist to this question. And, and how do you think that this affects one's mood? Okay, this is a, a difficult question to answer in a short time. So I'm going to try mm -hmm. and do it justice. Mm -hmm. So 
you're talking about sort of an intermittent fast, which has become very trendy. So mm. some people do the fasting every day where for, you know, eight hours they eat and for 16 they don't eat. Other people will maybe fast for 24 hours, twice a week, where they don't eat anything. But then on the other days they eat. Now, and then we get your question of maybe on the odd occasion, you just don't eat for one and a half days. You eat nothing. You just drink water and then the rest of the time you eat. The research is gray. So we are seeing a lot of studies showing the benefits of intermittent fasting, particularly for diabetes, for blood sugar control, weight management, but, but usually the benefits are short lived. We're seeing a lot of benefits for six to 18 months. And then after that, the benefit plateaus. And we don't see such a benefit from a health point of view. Hmm. And what we're also discovering, we're doing genetic testing now, is based on your genes. Intermittent fasting is not effective for certain people with certain genes, but it's very effective for others. And that's where you'll have some people say, no, but I fast for 30 hours. I feel better. I, I feel great. It doesn't impact me negatively. Whereas other people will say, yo, it's so difficult. Yo, it takes everything in me. The next day I've got a headache. I'm so irritable. I want to eat everything the next day. I'm so emotional and it doesn't work. So I think it comes down to always the answer with nutrition everybody's quite unique everybody's different what works for one doesn't necessarily work for another personally and I don't like to put my personal in, input in but even from what I've studied and read I'm not a big fan of of the 30-day fast the 24-hour day fasts purely because we're living in a modern world where tomorrow mm. you've got to get up early and cope and particularly for brain health for individuals that are battling with depression, anxiety, bipolar, any of our mental sort of disorder categories, we don't always recommend intermittent fasting because it's a form of like deprivation. And then you're not getting those chemicals. Your blood sugar may fluctuate and it can actually negatively affect the brain for somebody mm. who's battling. If you're chilled, no issue. Mental health, gut health, very good, nice. It's probably going to be fine. But it's something we don't recommend. It's too extreme. It's like an all or nothing approach. In my opinion, I'd be careful. Yeah. Thanks for that, Chris. And before I move on to the next question, I'd just like to inform our delegates that we'll be sharing the recording, um, the YouTube link, um, but we won't be sharing the presentation. So it'll only just be the recording a few days after this webinar has taken place. Um, and then I'm going to move on to the next question, um, Chris. You were going to the quality pro, you were going through the quality proteins list. So someone had a question about, um, chai seeds. Would they also fall under the quality protein, proteins list? Okay. So chai seeds are also very trendy at the moment. You'll see them everywhere on all the social media platforms. So chai seeds form under two groups. So they form under the fat group like the other seeds. So you might have heard of flax seeds, sunflower seeds, pumpkin mm -hmm. seeds, uh, linseeds, which are flax seeds. Chai seeds fall under the seed family, which is a healthy fat. They give us a lot of fiber as well. But they also do give us a small amount of protein. I don't typically put them under a protein group because the amount of protein is so small and you've got to eat humongous amounts. I put them under the healthy fat group. So yes, Chai seeds are wonderful for your gut. They are wonderful for your brain. They keep you full. They stabilize your blood sugar. But I'm also going to throw something out there. They're not total magic. Okay, like, like social media is saying, mm. don't get flax seeds, pumpkin seeds. In my opinion, I feel that the flax seeds, those are the brown ones, the pumpkin or the green, they are even more nutritious because they give you zinc, they give you omega-3 um, fiber. So I would say flax and pumpkin are my top seeds with chia. So don't just live on chia. Include the others as well. What I do is I buy a mix. I get a whole mix of seeds, and then I add them to yogurt, into smoothies, into stir fries, or you can even drink chia seeds. 
Awesome. Thank you. Um, so now we know that chair seeds fall under the category of good, um, healthy seeds. Um, Chris, someone would like to know, there's an interesting question here regarding, um, green tea or herbal tea and whether it's safe for people who are, who are on antiretroviral treatment. Yes. Yes. So herbal tea, especially the herbal teas, mm. your ginger, your fennel, because they are at such a low dose, it's a few of the herbs into a tea bag that you are soaking in water. Mm. It's not a heavily concentrated dose like a supplement. So generally with your antiretrovirals, they're fine. Green tea is a little bit more potent. From my knowledge, there's no interaction with the antiretroviral, so it won't make your medicine not work. But like caffeine, it can sometimes, what's the word, speed up its activity. So, you know, like uh, some people get like heart palpitations with a cup of coffee, mm -hmm. um, and then some people don't. Caffeine, uh, sorry, green tea contains caffeine, but it's a natural caffeine. But it, it shouldn't interact with your medication, no. Um, all right, thanks. So we have an answer for that. And then Cleo has quite an interesting question. She says, would you advise daily probiotic supplements in addition to a balanced diet for someone who's struggling with mental health? You know what? I, I'm, I'm going to say yes. Mm. I am a huge fan of a probiotic supplement. I'll tell you why. In yogurt, so let's say, like, yes, you're doing your fruit and vegetables, you're doing your healthy proteins, your seeds, lots of water, herbal teas. That's wonderful. Even yogurt has got bacteria. But to get the amount that you need, do you know how much yogurt you've actually got to eat? <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot of yogurt, and that might not be as good. And if you are battling with mental health, the chances are, you're missing out on some of the bacteria. So I would say you cannot go wrong. I almost feel like if it's within your budget, you can't go wrong anybody with taking mm. a good probiotic. And the, here's the hard part, which one? Now, obviously, I don't endorse any supplementation at all, but this becomes tough because we don't know which bacteria you're missing. I don't, I don't know which one I'm missing. It's a bit of a guessing game. So what I usually suggest to everybody is swap your probiotics. Don't just take one brand for the next year mm. because every brand is going to have something a little more, something a little less. So if you rotate your brands over the year, you will get a little bit of all the bacteria. But look out for that word I've mentioned, back, lactobacillus is quite an important bacteria. And this might be too much information, but there's something called a CFU, a colony forming unit. Look for that CFU on the bottle of the probiotic. And ideally, you want it more than 10 billion. Okay. So, yes, to answer your question, I, if you are able to, and I love that you said with a healthy diet, because taking a supplement doesn't replace, like now you can just eat junk. If you're eating well, I would include a probiotic. And, you know, it's something great because you could take it for, let's say, two months, then have a break for a month. Take it for another month, have a break. Take it Monday to Friday or Monday, Wednesday, Friday, depending on your budget. But try get them in. Um, that Yeah, great idea. You Just quickly on the probiotic supplement, we've had some people, like just HIV made me think, where, you know, they got sores in their mouth or they get like a, a thrush in their mouth or their tongue. And they take the probiotic capsule and you open it and you empty it on your tongue. It's like a powder. It's, re it's really fun. And they empty it and they sort of rub it all over their gums and their teeth. And, and you can. You can do that. And it really starts to heal just the linings in your mouth. Um, and then, of course, obviously you can swallow it. But no, I just thought really. I would share that. No, awesome. Thanks for that, Chris. And then Yakuba has a hand up. Um, Yakuba, we've allowed you to unmute your mic and speak. Are you able to? Yakuba, and alternatively, you can just type your question in the chat box and we will get to it. Um, there's quite an influx of questions, so I'm going to move on to the next one while we allow Yakoba to type the um, question on um, the chat box. 
So Sharon would like to know what your opinion is on chicory as a hot water drink, as a hot drink either made with milk or water. Yes. There are some benefits to it. What's lovely is, you know, some people with coffee, which I actually didn't mention today, mm. coffee can have a negative effect on the gut. It can give you diarrhea. It can also cause anxiety. So then people are looking for like this alternative, like what could I use instead of coffee? And you actually get a shikari coffee, um, which is a bit more natural. But yes, shikari, look, it's like the chia seeds. It's not magic. It's like lemons or, you know, everyone says, oh, lemons are going to help me lose weight. They're good. They are good for you. They've got vitamin C, but they're not magic. They're part of a solution. So if you don't like shikri, I wouldn't go and start having it. But if you like the shikri, you absolutely can. And as long as you don't have any issues with the milk. Milk is fine. It absolutely is fine. It's just some people with gut issues are quite sensitive to milk. And then they might need a lactose-free milk. Or a mm. milk with a lactase enzyme in it. Okay, awesome. So Jacoba has typed her question in the chat box. And she'd like to know what is the best product for memory loss? Are you asking for a supplement? I'm assuming. Let's it on a supplement. Are, assuming. Okay, it, this is a tough one with memory loss because I'd have mm -hmm. to know what caused the memory loss? Was it a trauma? Was it an accident? Is it a medical condition that you've got that is causing like an autoimmune condition? Is it age? You know, like just silly, I'm forgetting numbers. So the first thing with that, we'll get to the supplement, is obviously get the diet right. Stabilize the blood sugar. Watch your alcohol intake. Because often just a change in diet, I've had that with my clients, where they're just into regular eating, good wholesome carbs, proteins, fats, the right drinks. And often they'll say like, oh, my memory actually is sharper. But in terms of supplements, oh, it's such a difficult one. I mean, you might have heard of lion's mane at the moment. It's a sounds dreadful. It's actually from a mushroom, but it's very trendy. And I thought it was a bit of a gimmick, but we've looked at the science. Lion's mane has, is a supplement that is out there that can boost memory. Another one is choline, which is, maybe I must write it in the chat box, uh, choline or phospho, Ooh, now I'm going to look at my spelling, tidal choline, Ooh, something along those lines. Okay, choline, which is what you get in eggs, and phosphatidylcholine, we know, even is linked to genetics, is really great for like Alzheimer's, dementia, and memory so with genetic testing, we're actually seeing now that some people have a genetic mutation where they just have higher choline requirements, which you need a supplement. So I'd probably say lion's mane, but choline would be a really good one. Vitamin B12 as well. And something, you see, this is like once we start talking, it's a whole new world. <laughs> Check your vitamin D levels. Vitamin D, we often get it from the sun, but there is a lot of us are, are low in vitamin D, especially the older we get. It's a simple blood test you can do. And what we've seen with vitamin D, if it's low, depression, anxiety, memory issues. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're not depressed, you're not anxious, and you don't have memory issues. You just don't have vitamin D. And it mm -hmm. could be as simple as a vitamin D supplement and it sorts your memory out. Same with vitamin B12. So I think the important thing here is go question it. You're battling with your memory. Go speak to your doctor. Speak to somebody. Maybe do a couple of blood tests because it could be something so simple like a vitamin D. Awesome. Vitamin D, you heard it from the lady herself. Um, Chris, I know there are so many questions, but we do have to wrap up the session. I know. Thank you, everybody. You see what a big topic it is. <laughs> no, absolutely. It's a fascinating one. I'm just going to bring one more question to the floor, um, which is something that I think we all struggle with. Um, so how much coffee is too much? And this is the last one, and we'll close the session. Okay. So... Here's my answer, which you're going to get irritated with me. It depends. Okay, sometimes one cup of coffee is too much. I know this is a very difficult one. So let me answer this in two ways. For the general population, if you're generally pretty healthy, mm -hmm. any severe ulcers, reflux, bad anxiety, you're not going through menopause, like things are okay. 
The World Health Organization is generally saying three to four cups of coffee a day is absolutely acceptable. Mm. But obviously what's in that coffee? You know, if there's four sugars, four cream milk, coffee creamers, that's not a good thing. But if there's one sugar, a little bit of low-fat milk, three, four coffees, that's fine. Also with coffee, make sure you eat. We are seeing more side effects when you're having coffee without eating. So if you don't eat all day and your coffee just comes along, your blood sugar goes all over the place and you have mm. a high risk of anxiety. Whereas if you eat, even if it's small, your blood sugar levels are stable and then coffee comes for the ride. It affects you less. So yeah, general health, three to four, watch what's in it. But if you battle with anxiety, depression, sleep issues, or you are hitting in that hormonal stage, perimenopause, menopause. This has actually happened to me. True story. Watch your caffeine. I could always handle two cups of coffee. I cannot handle one. I get anxious. Mm. Yeah, it's, this is recent. It's the age I'm at. I'm giving my age away. The coffee is making me super, very, very anxious. Um, so for me, I need decaf. Mm. So listen to yourself. If you can have two or three cups and you're fine, you don't feel anxious, you sleep nicely, you're good. It's okay. Coffee does have a health benefit. It dilates the brain, the blood vessels. It increases alertness. There's some goodness to caffeine. Mm. It's just it's not for everybody. Usually anxiety and depression, it, it's worth cutting it down. Awesome. So let us take note of our coffee intake and our overall food intake. Chris, it has been a pleasure listening to you informing us about, you know, the gut brain connection this evening. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining. The participation has been great. We see all the hearts, all the applauds going up. And I think this was one of the phenomenal webinars that we've had. Um, so Chris, any final remarks from you? Look, thank you. Thank you for your passion. Um, I think my main comment, my final remark, don't make this stressful for yourselves. It mm. is an overwhelming topic. It's not worth getting stressed about. But just go change something. Then today wasn't a waste. Fruit, veggies, clean it up a little bit. Listen to your body as well. If we actually listen, our body tells us. So if you have milk and you get diarrhea, maybe we're going to go lactose-free milk. If your coffee causes anxiety, Maybe it's worth trying decaf. It's a lot of trial and error, mm. but enjoy the journey and see the benefits. If you're not enjoying it, it's not worth it. So, yeah, I hope that helps. Good luck, everybody.